What I'd like to do in the lecture today, it'll be somewhat different, fortunately, from the praxeology lecture that I gave on uh, Monday. I say, fortunately, it doesn't follow that you'll like this lecture. That could be equally bad, but <laughs> or even worse. But what I want to do in this lecture is first uh, <clears throat> discuss a feature of capitalism, of the free market, that Mises stressed especially. And he thought this feature was important not only in explaining how the free market operated, but also as a justification for the market, a defense of the market. And then I want to go on to consider uh, various types of interference with the free market measures, such as price and wage control, and the way in which Mises criticized those. And uh, since I find it difficult to stay away from philosophy for long, I'll say a few things about the role of value judgments in economics and how uh, particularly Mises' approach here. Uh, now, one of the main criticisms of the free market that was, has been advanced by socialists, I'm sure uh, you've heard this, is that in the, a capitalist system, it, a few wealthy business people, a few capitalist bankers and others control what's being produced. And the claim of so-called democratic socialists is in a system of democratic socialism, it would be the people as a whole who decided what would be produced, just as in a democracy, it's the people who elect the political leaders. In an economic democracy, it would be the people who decide what's being produced. So Mises had a very ingenious way of responding to this argument that was also uh, but not only a response to the argument, it was very important as an explanatory feature of the how the free market works. It, <laughs> uh, what he said was, in capitalism, the consumers, the people who buy the uh, consumer goods, control what is produced. Now, why is that? Why is it that consumers are controlling what's produced? Well, business owners are trying to make money. Otherwise, they, they would, wouldn't be in business. That's their purpose. If you own, a, operate a business, you want, it to make a pro, want to make a profit. So the way you do that is to provide consumers with what they want. And Mises speaks in this uh, respect of what he calls the dollar votes of consumers. He says that when you spend money on a uh, product, you're in effect voting for that product. You're voting that that product be produced. And he calls this system one of consumer sovereignty. So you see how in in using these phrases of consumer sovereignty and dollar volts, he's really responding to this criticism that I mentioned that the socialists raised against capitalism. They said that uh, under capitalism, it's the rich businessmen who decide what's being produced. And Mises said, no, it isn't that at all. It's the consumers who decide what's being produced because the business people are trying to make a profit, and so they want to produce what the consumers favor, what they want. 
Now, there's, an obje there's objections that could be raised to Mises' argument. One of them was raised by the uh, uh, communist economist Maurice Dobb, D-O-B-B, -B, was taught at Cambridge University for many years. He was a, uh, there were some suggestions, there were some hints he may have been involved in the famous Cambridge spy rings, but I don't think that's been proved. But Dobb in one book said, well, Mises is talking about dollar votes, but don't rich people have a lot more dollars than uh, other people? So can't they really still control what's being produced? It reminds me of a, fa a story once about Abraham Lincoln. There was a meeting of his cabinet in which Lincoln made a certain proposal and then he put it to a vote of the cabinet. Everybody in the cabinet was against the proposal, so, but he was in favor. So he, he, Lincoln said, uh, well, the, vo the vote is one in favor, seven against. The eyes have it. So he was the one who decided because his vote counted for more. So you see, this criticism is, well, don't rich people have more votes so they can, if Mises is talking about the, the consumer sovereignty and dollar vote, isn't it the rich people are controlling, still controlling what's being produced? But Mises answered this, that although individual rich people have more votes than an individual poor person, the masses as a whole still have the most votes. And he calls capitalism mass production for the masses. And even more important, I think, is another feature that of the consumer sovereignty that Mises stressed. In a uh, political democracy, especially one where you have a majority vote principle, one candidate wins and other people lose. Sometimes in proportional voting, you can have more than one winner. People are getting votes in proportion to the number of votes their political party receives. But still, there are losers. Some people are outvoted. But under capitalism, as long as a small number of people want a certain product, the products will be produced even if most people don't want it. There are products that uh, appeal to only very specialized markets, and as long as it's profitable to produce those, they will be produced even if the, uh, most people wouldn't want the product. So Mises is then saying not only do we have, in effect, a democracy of the market that guides production, but this is better than political democracy because in political democracy, you have just some people win, others lose, but in the democracy of the market and the consumer sovereignty, practically everyone will get what he wants produced because it's in the interests of the producers to uh, give them what they want. Now, uh, Murray Rothbard certainly accepted the basic idea that I've been explaining that Mises gave. In fact, if you read Manning Economy State, he explains in detail how the choices of the consumers guide production. But he didn't like the phrase consumer sovereignty. And his objection to the phrase was, this is a sovereignty is a political concept. It, it's usually applied to government. So the sovereign has the power to tell people what to do, the sovereign. But this isn't the case in the market. In supposing the owner of a business doesn't want, doesn't care about the consumers, he said, I'm going to produce this my way I don't. I have a restaurant. I don't care if people don't like the way I cook food. 
you're going to get the consume the people here are going to eat it my way or not at all. He won't be put in jail for doing that. Uh, he, but so, whereas under uh, uh, if it were a political matter, he could be ordered by the government to do that. So it isn't the consumers could say to this person, "We order you to produce what we want." It's just rather that if he doesn't, he'll lose money. So Rothbard didn't like the phrase consumer sovereignty. Incidentally, uh, this phrase consumer sovereignty comes from the another free market economist, uh, W.H. Hutt, William H. Hutt, who was a British economist but taught in South Africa for most of his life. And he used the phrase consumer sovereignty in his book, uh, Economists and the Public, I think came out in around 1936 and also in some articles in South Africa Journal of Economics. Now, I should say Hutt is somebody who would be much more vulnerable to Rothbard's criticism than Mises is because what Hutt said was really people who don't produce what consumers want are really doing something bad and they should be forced to do so. For example, he thought that supposing, let's say you were very talented people, obviously you all are because you're attending the Mises University, but supposing you could earn some very high salary, let's say you could be uh, produce, be, say you work in as lawyers and you make a whole lot of money, this is what consumers want. So suppose you said, though, I don't want to do that, I'd rather just uh, not make much money and be a, a beach bum. If that's not a politically incorrect term, I don't keep up with these things. But supposing somebody said, well, I just don't want to bother doing what the consumers want, Hutt thought you could really be forced to do that. He actually gave the example of an artist who didn't want to produce very many pictures, didn't want to paint many pictures. He thought this would rain because he thought that, say, the artist thought that uh, if he didn't paint very many pictures, he could get higher prices for the ones he did paint. Hutt said, that's withholding supply, so he shouldn't be allowed to do that. But Mises doesn't say anything like that. Mises is just emphasizing that it's in the interests of the producers to satisfy consumers because that's how they make money. If they don't, then uh, the consumers will, per will purchase products from other people and they'll tend to lose money, the ones who don't produce what the consumers want. So money will flow from the ones who don't give the consumers what they want to the ones who do. Uh, Mises goes so far as to say, and this is one point that uh, Rothbard differed with him, is that Mises goes so far as to say that, in effect, the uh, consumers are the real owners of the means of production. And uh, in general, Mises was not sympathetic to Lockean or natural rights uh, views of property ownership where Rothbard was, where Rothbard said uh, people acquire property by mixing their labor with, un with previously unowned land or other natural resources. Mises didn't like that. He didn't think natural law arguments had any basis. So that was one difference of Mises and Rothbard. So as I've explained so far, we can understand how those who produce consumer goods will respond to consumer demand. They'll be trying to produce what the consumers want. But as you know, not all goods on the market are consumer goods. What about producers' goods? What about the other, say, uh, some 
goods are not bought by consumers at all. You don't go down to the store and say, buy a ton of steel, not unless it's a very unusual store. So what about these other goods? Uh, and this you will already understand in lectures that have been previously given on imputation. We can understand how the price, how the de uh, demand by consumers really will determine all of production. Uh, it, it, this operates in this fashion. Those who produce consumer goods will demand first level production goods. That's to say, they'll want goods that will enable them to produce the consumer's goods. And they'll try to get these at the least cost that they can. So the, pro the producers of these first level production goods will be trying to meet the demands of those who produce consumers goods, just in the same way we have at the initial level, the ones who sell consumer goods are trying to satisfy the consumers. The ones who have the first level production goods are trying to satisfy those who produce consumer goods. And we can keep going on this uh, till uh, however many stages of production there are the producers of the second level production goods will try to meet the demands of those who produce the first level production goods. So you see, it's really consumer demand that determines all the production because the consumers are, are deciding which consumer goods they want and then the consumer goods will produce, the ones who sell the consumer goods will then demand production goods in accord with the demands of the consumer goods, and this will keep going on to higher and higher stages. Now, one mistake to avoid here in this notion of imputation, where you have the, you get, once you get the demand for the consumer goods, that will enable you to get the demand prices for all the other goods. One mistake to avoid is to think that this process is automatic. Uh, Joseph Schumpeter the, was a great economist from Austria, although not a member of the Austrian school, used this point about imputation to criticize Mises' socialist calculation argument. What he said was, look, once you get prices of consumer goods, and we could imagine a socialist economy doing that, and Mises accepted that, then you could get by imputation all the price of all the production goods. So there wouldn't be any problem of calculation. But what we have to realize to see the fallacy here is that this process isn't automatic. The adjustment of the supply to demand at each level is something that they undertaken by entrepreneurs and they display their entrepreneurial judgment in anticipating what the demand is. It isn't, it, it isn't something that just happens automatically. Uh, now, so far, so we have then this notion that Mises has defended, it's really in the capitalist system, it's really the consumers who determine what's being produced. It's really a system of democracy that's much better than political democracy. But some people, whether or not they accept that argument, they would say, even if that argument is right, there's still a problem that in this system, as I've explained it, the, the key factor that enables the system to work, the motivating factor, is that the business people are trying to make as much money as they can. Because of that, that's why they, uh, they adjust production to the demand that the consumers want. But there are some people who say, 
people shouldn't be motivated exclusively by trying to make money. This is not a good thing. Instead, people should act by moral standards. For example, uh, they should all always pay workers a living wage, avoid charging high prices for necessity. Pe the people should follow certain moral standards in their economic decisions rather than be motivated by the desire to attain money. Uh, you remember Karl Marx in Das Kapital uh, makes fun of the capitalists who are uh, motivated by trying to get as much money as possible. And he says, accumulate, accumulate, that is Moses and the prophets. So by, he's refer, by Moses and prophets, he's referring to the Bible. So he's saying, well, the capitalists just believe in accumulating money as a religion, and the suggestion is this isn't very good. Of course, Ayn Rand would probably say it is very good, and people who deny it are, are bad. But that isn't what uh, Mises responded. Uh, if, let's suppose, people did operate according to the moral standards, that, uh, such as always paying a living wage and avoiding charging high prices for necessity, if they did that, uh, production wouldn't be responding to consumer demands because the producers would be following certain uh, they would be producing according to these moral requirements. So one way to challenge that would be just to say, try to come up with, say, are they really moral requirements and try to argue on the basis of uh, ethics, moral philosophy. But Mises had a very different type of criticism of this objection. I mean, the objection is, look, according to you, this is a, a capitalism in capitalism. Uh, the w uh, producers are trying to satisfy consumers. So we have a system of d uh, economic democracy. But the motivation is businessmen are trying to make as much money as they can. That isn't a good idea. People shouldn't do that. So Mises, and we'll see this also later in the lecture, tries to avoid appeals to moral judgments, and we'll see why he does that later. But So what he says is not that these critics have the wrong view of morality, but he says people who say that businesses shouldn't be, seek profit don't have an alternative criterion on what businesses should do. They just have certain vague ethical requirements as they conceive them. They don't really say this is what the businesses should do. So if they don't, if businesses don't charge market prices, supposing, say, uh, there is some uh, necessity, say they think bread is a very important thing for people to have, so they charge very low prices for that, then there'll be a, a shortage of bread. People will demand more bread than, than is produced at that price, and they'll, the system, the economic system won't work. So Mises says, unless you can come up with some way of determining what the prices are, you won't have economic calculation. You won't be able to know what goods should be priced at, at, at what prices. When he says this, he's not making a value judgment. He's not saying what's good or bad, although pretty obviously he thought going against the market was, was bad from his point of view. But he's just pointing out what's required for economic calculation. We have to have some way of setting prices, and under capitalism we do, and we have the motivation that people are trying to make as much money as possible, and under this alternative where we say, or people say, the uh, people shouldn't be motivated by making as much money as possible, we don't have an alternative.
criteria. You can see this pretty directly because if you say people shouldn't be motivated by making, trying to make as much money as they can, that's just saying what they shouldn't be motivated by. It doesn't say how they should act. It isn't giving any specifications on how they should act so we wouldn't be able to determine prices just by saying they shouldn't be motivated by making money. <clears throat> now, uh, this <clears throat> leads to the more general topic of interventionism. And one uh, way the government can act is trying to supplant the free market completely, say, under socialism. We have the government trying to just take over production of goods and services. But there's another way the government can interfere with the free market other than just getting rid of it altogether. It can pass laws that restrict market transactions in certain ways, such as price control, which would include minimum wage laws and rent control and tariffs. These, if you have uh, these measures, they don't get rid of the free market. We still have private businesses that are making their pricing decisions in response to consumer demand, but the process is being interfered with by government regulations. So Mises has, criticizes various types of interventionism, but he follows a characteristic pattern of argument in all of these. Uh, the pattern is that we first take whatever the goal is the interventionist wants, or at least the ostensible goal, what he says he wants. Then we show that the intervention won't achieve this, that you won't get what you want if you do this. And what's important to see in this pattern is this is a value-free method of arguing. It isn't that Mises is saying, I don't like intervention or this is bad. It's that he says, you won't get what you want. That isn't a value judgment, where by value judgment we mean the expression of certain preferences about what should or shouldn't be the case. It's just a factual claim. It's saying this is what's going to happen if you do such and such. Now, let's take uh, price control as an example. Uh, supposing the government thinks that the price of milk is too high. Uh, at the high price, the poor find it hard to buy milk. They don't have enough, they don't have enough money for the for uh, milk, so the government isn't going to be cowed by that. It, uh, I was supposed to laugh at that point. Uh, the government then says, we're going to impose a maximum price on milk, so then it'll be easier for the poor to buy milk. So uh, one way you could criticize that is if somebody said, well, I don't think that's appropriate or it's wrong of the government to do that. That's interfering with the private property rights of the milk producers, and that's uh, ethically wrong to do that. That would, in, if you criticized uh, price control in that way, that would be an appeal to a value judgment, but that isn't uh, what Mises does. He just wants to say, well, suppose they do, the government does that, what's going to happen? He's making, asking a strictly factual question. He said, at the lower price, more milk will be demanded by consumers, but suppliers won't supply more because at the lower price, at the, the, at the, the amount they supply, I mean, there's the will be uh, at a certain price will depend on the particular supply curve. And we wouldn't expect that if the price gets lower, they're going to supply more, quite the contrary. And marginal sellers, those who are making the least 
return will leave the business of selling milk. They'll say, with these new low prices, it's not going to be profitable for us to produce milk anymore. So we're getting out of the milk supply business. Now you notice here that Mises is assuming that when he says the marginal sellers are going to leave the business, he's assuming that people in the business aren't all earning the same return. If that were the case, then the low price would make everybody leave. But he's saying, no, just the marginal sellers will leave. So it's only in equilibrium, which we're, we never really attain, that uh, every all the businesses are in the same return. So there's some businesses that are not do it, they're just barely making a profit at existing prices. So then the new governmentally imposed lower prices will make them leave. So what has happened here? Well, the, uh, the suppliers aren't supplying more. And in fact, some milk suppliers have left the business altogether. So there's less milk available. And this wasn't what the price control was supposed to do because remember, the purpose of the price control was to make milk available to poor people at a lower price, but the result is you have less milk available than before. So here what Mises is saying is that the measure, the price control has failed to achieve its purpose. It's failed from the point of view of those who favor it. And when he says this, he's not making a value judgment. This is a strict, strictly factual claim. This is what's going to happen if price controls are imposed. And we can see exactly the same process with rent control. Just go through the same step. Uh, under rent control, the purpose is to make more housing available to the poor. But, but at the rent control price, more housing is demanded that is available. It's exactly, you see exactly parallel argument to the one I gave on the price control for milk. So people will, at lower rents, more people will want to rent uh, apartments or houses than before, but the landlords won't be willing to supply more. On the contrary, those who aren't going, won't be making money under the new rent control will withdraw housing from the market and they'll avoid making repairs. So the result will be that the housing situation for the poor uh, is worsened. So again, the result is the aims of rent control aren't achieved. It's amazing how many uh, sometimes you see people falling for this fallacy. Uh, there was a law professor, uh, Margaret Radin, who was quite influential, who had a, had a suggestion that she thought that uh, people who have lived in an apartment for a, a long time, a number of years, should get property rights in the apartment so that the landlord would be unable to kick them out. And she didn't realize that if that if such a law were passed, then it would be in the interests of the landlords to make sure they got out before the set number of years by which the tenants could acquire ownership. So you have the same pattern where somebody proposes a law is supposed to have certain goals, but the measure doesn't attain what the goal is suggested is it has just the reverse. So this, again, is the characteristic pattern that Mises uses. Now, we I'll just go through uh, another case which is very important. Uh, I'm from uh, Los Angeles, and we just had in Los Angeles there's new minimum wage laws. These are very popular. And th these are supposed to raise wages for workers. They're not intended to harm workers. But 
the minimum wage is a price floor, say wages can't go below a certain point. So at, if the minimum wage is a, 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 above the market wage, then more workers will want to work at the minimum wage and employers are willing to hire. So workers who aren't worth the minimum wage, the employer will either be fired or not hired. So again, the intervention fails to achieve the goal. And uh, we can see this also with tariffs, where tariff is a tax on uh, goods that are coming into the country, supposed to help domestic producers. But the result of having a tariff is to make a product more costly for consumers. And, and by decreasing competition, they enable cartels to be produced. So one of the, the people who favor tariffs say, well, this will help, say, American prosperity if we have tariffs, but the result will be we'll have higher prices for consumers, more cartels, less competition. So again, the result of the interventionist measure is counter to what the advocates support. Now, what happens when the intervention fails? Well, one thing that could happen is, say, the government, the uh, people in government have read their Mises or Henry has, it says, they say, oh, we made a terrible mistake. We're not going to, we're going to repeal the measure. But that rarely happens. They instead very likely say, we have to have more intervention to cure the problems caused by the first intervention. For example, to take the case I started with, we have the milk suppliers have uh, compulsory lower prices for milk. So suppose the milk sellers say, well, we can't make a profit under these new low prices. Then the government might respond by imposing price controls on the suppliers of the milk sellers to lower their costs. And we can see if they do that, these interventions will also fail. And supposing the government keeps doing this, they just say, well, this intervention didn't work, so we'll try another one. If they do that, then it'll lead to total government control of the economy because you'll have price controls for everything and you won't have any free market prices. This actually t took place in Germany during World War I. Uh, you had a so-called Hindenburg Plan, which was named for the general Paul von Hindenburg. Remember, he, he was the, the general who was very long-lasting. He had fought in the Franco-Prussian War of 1870, but he was still around in uh, he was the one who appointed Hitler Chancellor of Germany in January 1933, so he lasted a very long time. He, he did a lot of damage over a long period. But under this Hindenburg plan, it was really one of total control of the German economy by the government by having price, control, price and wage regulations of everything. And this was a method of having government take over the economy just by price and wage control was also used in Britain during World War I and World War II. And in this connection, Mises makes the, in one of his lectures, makes the somewhat rather startling claim that socialism didn't come to England after 1945, remembering 1945, the Labour Party, the British Socialist Party, under Clement Attlee, replaced Winston Churchill as Prime Minister. Churchill was the Conservative Prime Minister, but Mises said it was Churchill who brought socialism to government, not the post-war Labour government, because it was under Churchill that price control 
was imposed. And this is rather surprising because Churchill uh, was, had praised Hayek's road to serfdom. He was a reader of Garrett Garrett, who was a great uh, American supporter of free enterprise. But Mises said, well, he, uh, whatever he thought, whatever his be it professed belief, he was the one who brought socialism to England. And this type of control by the government, where the government sets all prices and wages, is a type of socialism. You have private property that people, the businesses are still owned in some sense by private comp by private people or their private corporations, but the government is telling them what to do at each stage. And this was characteristic of the Nazi system that uh, Mises considers this a type of socialism. Socialism is not just a system where the government directly owns the means of production. It can be one where the government controls production even though the forms of private property are, uh, are kept in place. The, this, when Mises points this out, he, he's making it important uh, counter to the Marxist, because under the Marxist interpretation of Nazism, for example, you find in a book by uh, Franz Neumann, Behemoth, it was uh, published by Oxford University Press, the claim is that under the Nazi system, because the big businesses that were in control, Hitler was in some sense a puppet of the big business people. But actually, as Mises points out, it was the government that ran things. The Marxists were wrong. It wasn't the businessmen in control because they weren't the ones who were setting the prices and wages. The government was telling them what to do. Uh, now, there's another, and this will be, I think, the last type of in, uh, intervention I want to consider, is uh, taxation. Uh, Many people favor very high taxes on the rich. Uh, you'll find, for example, this book that came out uh, by uh, Thomas Piketty, the French economist. He thinks it's really terrible that some people earn much or much more than others. Uh, very wealthy people have hundreds of times more in salary than poor people. The government should really do something about that by having very heavy taxes on the rich. So Mises, again, doesn't make a value judgment, say, uh, well, I don't think there's anything wrong with inequality. Instead, he says, what happens if the government does this? Well, if you have such taxes, it'll make it very difficult for the rich to save and build up accumulations of capital. But if you have large accumulations of capital, this raises workers' productivity, so this will make wages rise. So if you have taxes on the rich, this hurts the poor. It's supposed to say, well, you're supposed to say, well, you're having these taxes because they're supposed to make Incomes more equal, but if you have them, they'll worsen the position of the poor because it's through capital accumulation that the poor get more money because wages on the free market are determined by the marginal productivity of labor. And if you have an increase in capital, this will enable the marginal productivity of labor to rise. Now again, this is, I think, one, perhaps uh, the big point I'd like you to take away from this le lecture. If you just remember one thing, that's more than I would remember. But, oops, so much. Well, that's water under the floor now. Uh, okay, so remember, Mises here is not saying I don't like taxes on the rich or claiming these taxes are morally bad. He's not making a value judgment. He's saying 
here's the consequence of high taxation. So this is a strictly scientific value free uh, claim. Now you might think, well, it's value free, but it sounds like there's a trick involved here because wouldn't almost everybody think that something that hurts the poor is, is to that extent bad. So is the judgment really value free? Some of those who say, well, uh, socialist calculation is, is impossible. So if you have a socialist economy, this is going to lead to chaos. Is that really a value free judgment? I mean, who likes chaos? But it is a value free judgment, something like a doctor's claim smoking causes lung cancer, which is value free, even though probably nobody wants lung cancer. I'll just end then by reminding you of, tell, of the story of the man who read so much about how bad smoking is for your health that he gave up reading. Okay, thanks very much. <laughs>